Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Steven Ibanez. I'm a PhD student at Stanford University, and I'd like to introduce Camila. And she is a PhD student at ETH Zurich, work, working with Adrian Perry. And uh, today she's going to tell us about her experience writing a P4 program and compiling it to an FPGA. So uh, looking forward to it. Thank you. Um, so um, uh, today I am going to talk about this project from the viewpoint of a software engineer. I am a research engineer, in fact, and um, research software engineer specifically. And so the um, adventure into FPGA land was a rather, um, rather a learning experience for me. And um, so that's what I would like to share here today. So let's dive right in. Um, first of all, I'm going to introduce you to the problem of what I am trying to achieve and why. Um, second, I'm going to try to give you the perspective uh, of how I, as a software engineer, learned to think about hardware um, in a way that actually helped me solve some problems. Um, then I will uh, walk you through the adventures of building this future. And in the end, I will summarize uh, what I've learned from the experience and what could be useful for you people if you decide to do a similar thing. Um, so let's dive right in. First of all, um, why are we doing this? Well, for me, because I needed my master's, but uh, also um, in general, because uh, the uh, network security group at, at the Hatsuri is working on this new protocol called Scion. This is an internet scale protocol. So we're talking about interdomain routing. And I'm not going to do, go into many details here, but what, um, if you're curious, you're welcome to visit the website um, and see um, some details about it. But what I do need to explain is, since we are building a router, um, we need to explain how routing works in this protocol. Um, now, what's, um, uh, what's special about the, um, uh, sorry, about uh, Scion routing is that the um, intended path through the network is in the packet header. So um, when a router gets a packet, it needs to find its hop in the packet header, in, in the path, by following a pointer in the header, then it needs to verify some cryptographic information, and then it increments the pointer for the next router, and it sends it forwards. And the same thing happens on every router, crypto, increment pointer, send forwards, and so on. Um, and um, so this is quite unusual. This is not how normal routing protocols work. And so it is an open question whether it is practical and economical to build such routers. And to answer this question, and also to improve the protocol design and make it more practical and economical ideal, ideally, uh, we will try to build a router like that and see what problems we run into and how it all goes. Um, now, how do we build a fast router for this? Um, there is a spectrum of options for high-speed packet for forwarding um, from software solutions, um, uh, to hardware such as existing routers or programmable switches, and these are very fast. Um, but because Scion is special, on one hand, we need quite a lot of flexibility to be able to implement it. Um, we evaluated the options further to the right here and where the and Scion can't be implemented on these easily or um, can't be fully implemented. In it. Um, and on the other hand, we also want something that is cost effective and high performant. Uh, so that we answer our question of whether it can be built. And so what we chose to use is an FPGA or programmable hardware. Um, uh, and uh, not, not only is this a solution that's both sufficiently flexible and sufficiently performant, but it also gives us uh, some insight into hardware design. And so it is a, 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 we learn more generally applicable things here. Um, so what exactly we used is the NetFPGA SUME uh, card which has 4 10 gigabit uh, ports and a pretty uh, large, uh, good FPGA in it. And thanks to Steve's team, um, among others, uh, uh, there is a P4 compiler, uh, which allows us to write P4 code and then uh, uh, compile it into uh, an FPGA design that runs on the NetFPGA. So now that we know what hardware we are running on, we can define our performance target. Since we have four ports at 10 gigabits uh, uh, and we want to r run at line rate, because why not? Uh, what we are trying to achieve is at the total sustained throughput of 40 gigabits per second. And we want to be able to do this also with the smallest possible frames. So that means processing about 60 million packets per second. Great, so now we know what we are trying to do, Rout router at line speed on the NetFPGA. Um, 
and before I tell you about um, how I built the router, I first want to explain how I think about hardware, how, how I as a software engineer needed to change my perspective in order to be able to solve the problems I ran into. Um, so let's talk about that. Um, in software, we think uh, about software as a sequence of instructions which um, operates uh, on the data one after another. Um, uh, in contrast, hardware is a fixed circuit. So the data moves through this fixed circuit. And if we want to perform, for example, operations A, B, and C on our data, uh, then we will have a part of the circuit that does A, a part that does B, and a part that does C, and the data will move through the different parts of the circuit. Uh, so that's why I like to say that uh, for hardware, we need to think in space, not in time. In software, things are a sequence of instructions, so they kind of come in time. While in hardware, we are, we are thinking about how our circuit is laid out and how data moves through this fixed circuit. Um, now, what's interesting about having a fixed circuit is that the part that does A uh, is always there, even when our packet is already in B. And so that leads to this idea of pipelining. By running, the, uh, by, if we keep all of the parts busy all the time, uh, so we run uh, data through all the stages all the time in parallel, we can achieve a very high throughput uh, despite needing some longer time to process each packet. We are doing a lot of things in parallel and thus we get a higher performance. And what's interesting about pipelining is that if we need to make the processing more complex by adding another stage, uh, we can, uh, th this will increase the latency of our processing. Now we need four cycles instead of three, but this does not uh, decrease throughput. We are still getting a packet out on every, uh, every cycle, and thus uh, this way we can keep a high throughput even when we add more complex operations. So that's why pipelining is great. Now this sounds amazing, but of course there uh, one can run into problems. Um, specifically, if one puts too much logic into a single, single state of the pipeline, uh, the delay uh, uh, that it takes for, for, for the processing on, of that stage uh, can be too large, and then the data will arrive too late into the next stage. Um, and this, uh, this, uh, this uh, is called the timing constraint violation, and uh, this will cause the circuit to not work at the intended speed. Now what we can do with this, either we slow down the whole circuit to accommodate for the one stage that is being slow, but that's not really great, that will lower our performance. Um, but the, a better solution is to either split the problematic stage into two smaller stages. And that way, um, we, thanks to pipelining, we don't lose any throughput if we do this, we only increase latency. Or another option is to make the stage, the problematic stage run faster by making it more parallel and thereby take less uh, time to execute uh, uh, all the way through. So that's uh, some background ideas to keep in mind about hardware. And now I can tell you about uh, how I uh, built the Scion router and what challenges I encountered. So the first interesting thing to do was um, adding uh, AES encryption functionality into the pro uh, project, into the NetFPGA. Um, as I mentioned earlier, in Scion, the hops in the past are cryptographically authenticated by an AES-based message authentication code. So what we need to do is to be able to do AES from inside our P4 code. Um, the great thing about the, the P4 NetFPGA project is that it lets us define custom externs. Um, uh, so what we can do is declare an extern in P4. Um, here uh, on the slide, you can see the, um, uh, an example extern declaration. And uh, this, uh, uh, this declaration will then make the compiler generate an interface for us and then we can provide a native uh, implementation for this extern. There are some technical details here, um, such as uh, uh, the extern implementation must be pipelined because everything is pipelined. Uh, the, the, the extern must be named in a specific way because of the way the scripts handled it. Um, and one can only call the extern once per declaration, um, but once you, um, uh, once you figure these out, uh, you can. Uh, th this allows you to mix and match the high-level P4 code with some highly optimized native implementations. So in our case, uh, 
uh, uh, we got a very fast uh, AES implementation uh, that we can call from before and use it to do the check. Uh, so the, the message here is that uh, well, we can mix and match as we need. Uh, we can do the uh, parts which make sense in P4 and then we can provide optimized native things um, for, for, for uh, the uh, tight parts of the code. Um, another interesting part here uh, was coping with the Scion header. So this is a non-trivial problem because the Scion header, as uh, I already mentioned, contains the path and uh, this is a variable number of hop fields in the header and there is a pointer to the current hop and uh, we need to output this path unchanged uh, in the dparser. So there are some obvious things we can try, right? So in P4, we have header stacks. We should, this looks like a header stack, so we should be able to use that. Unfortunately, though, header stacks are not supported on the NetFPGA. PGA. Um, well, oh well. Um, that's not too bad of a problem because we don't actually need the whole path. We only need to save it so that we can output it in the dparser. And so why don't we just use a varbit field to save the beginning of the path, get to our hop field, and then uh, do it that way. Well, it turns out varbit is also not supported on the NetFPGA, and so this turns into a non-trivial problem. And so I will split it into two sub-problems. And the first sub-problem is we, the, the, we need to figure out how to output the path in the dparser, even though we cannot save it because the sector of varbit are not supported. But we don't actually need to do anything else with the path. We just need to make it come out in, in the dparser. And so uh, the thing to do here is we, if we can avoid, completely avoid needing to recreate the header on the output, then we have no problem. Um, and it turns out that there is a Xilinx extension called packet mock. Uh, this is not standard P4 and it takes a bit of work to make it work. But once uh, we can do that, it allows us to write the parsers very differently. With packet mode, the, the parsers are kind of a mirror image of, of uh, the parser. You can see that it's actually declared as a parser. Um, and instead of uh, recreating the header from scratch, like in normal P4, here we can um, uh, essentially replicate the structure of the, of the parser and only update some relevant parts of the header, which change and leave the rest unchanged. So this way, uh, the interesting thing here to note is that this is kind of the other side of the flexibility of uh, FPGAs. So uh, the P4 generated uh, code is a part of a larger design and thus we can use P4 where it suits us and we can use not P4, we can use something else where that something else works better. In this case, we are using the uh, non-standard extension. We could use something completely different too. Um, but what matters is that uh, we have a lot of flexibility here. Um, and so with this approach, thanks to this uh, extension, the path comes out unchanged and we only need to now solve the second sub-problem, which is getting to my hop field. So what we want to do is skip over the unused hops and read my hop, right? So obvious solution, once again, packet advance, standard P4 feature. Unfortunately, this only works when X is a compile time constant, when we are skipping something that is known at compile time. Uh, so we cannot actually use it to skip over the variable and path. Um, and thus, well, another option would be a loop in the parser. Um, so, uh, so, so loop while you are not at the right hop field. Uh, but unfortunately, this loop needs to be unrolled and that results in a very deep circuit and that does not pipeline well. So this is not a great solution. And also we ran into a compiler bug uh, when we tried this, but so we weren't even able to uh, compile the design, but even if we did, this would not work well. Um, and so what we result, uh, result to do is this sort of a big bad if, where we, uh, 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 we uh, check uh, the number of hops that we need to skip over, and we just create a bunch of branches so let's say 64 branches that skip over either one or one or da 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 or 63 uh, hops. Um, this is, this, this uh, is 
really wide, but it's not uh, very deep and it will pipeline quite well because all of these um, branches um, execute in parallel and thus we don't know it will pipeline well. But of course, it doesn't work all that well either. Um, this requires a lot of FPGA area. You're essentially duplicating the code that skips over things 64 times. And so that's not a great solution either. Um, and so what we ended up doing is modifying this big bad if idea into a two stage idea where we first skip in multiples of eight uh, and then we skip in individual bytes uh, by looking first at the most significant uh, half and then the, the least significant half of the uh, number of hops. And so this way we have this two stage approach uh, with eight branches in each stage. So uh, what we have is uh, twice the latency, but we are only using the square root of the area compared to the previous approach. And this leads to a less full FPGA and uh, ultimately to a better performing, to better performance. So uh, previously I said that wide is usually better than deep, but sometimes the depth versus width trade-offs are worth thinking about because you might be able to save a lot by sacrificing only a little of the other. Okay, so that's uh, helped us uh, deal with the parser. Um, another um, trick that we used here was um, uh, trying to not implement everything in hardware. And I think this is quite important. Uh, the Cyan protocol is quite complex and implementing all of it in hardware would first of all take forever. And second, it wouldn't even be a good idea. For example, handling control messages or uh, the nuances of error handling. Uh, uh, that's quite a lot of code that doesn't actually need to be in the fast path. Um, and so uh, what we ended up doing is the NetFPGA uh, exposes these virtual interfaces to the host. It looks like a network card to the host. Um, and so what we do is if we cannot handle a packet, the, uh, let's say uh, a packet comes on Ethernet zero interface uh, that we cannot handle, we will just pass it through without modifying it into the uh, into the host, uh, where it looks like it just came from a normal network card. Uh, there, it can be processed by an unmodified software router, which is already implemented by someone else in this project. And then whatever the router decides to do, maybe it modifies the packet and makes it come out on the third interface instead. And then we just transparently pass it through uh, in, into the physical cable. And this way, we are able to um, to keep only the fast path in the hardware and uh, keep the and, and uh, keep the uh, keep the hardware design much cleaner and simpler. So the idea is not everything belongs in hardware, and it's worthwhile to think about what should go into hardware and what should go into software. And the last problem I want to talk about is uh, timing constraints. So uh, after implementing um, many of, uh, uh, of, uh, of these, uh, for example, the complicated parser code or uh, some other parts, um, and then uh, putting in some workarounds for bugs, uh, we ended up with a lot of logic. And uh, in P4, uh, we don't have control, direct control over the pipeline stages. So we cannot quite do the trick from the beginning uh, where we split a stage into two if we need to. And the NetFPGA compiler made too few stages given how much logic we were putting into it, presumably because nobody was expecting such complex uh, logic. And so our project couldn't meet timing. And so then what comes in is optimization. How do we make this meet timing if we can't uh, uh, split the stage into two? Um, so the first important concept here is the concept of a critical path. Uh, this is the, uh, the, 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 the path uh, that uh, causes the maximum delay. So that, that would be the one that has the most operations on it or the longest operations on it. And then we want to uh, somehow optimize this critical path. Um, and we can do that um, by several uh, methods. Uh, one thing we can do is that, uh, as I already said, wider or do, uh, doing things in parallel is usually better than doing things serially. Um, and so if you have code where you need to uh, make some computation, computation one, and then based on that, uh, you make a computation two, 
and then you create your result. It might be worth uh, trying to restructure the code so that you can run computation one and computation two independently and then combine the result um, so that your code is uh, less deep and has less long dependency chains. Um, uh, and another thing to do is to think about data locality. Um, um, so uh, if you create small, simple, and self-contained modules, um, that is control, actions, um, and so forth, uh, if you make them small and self-contained, and uh, if, you create, if you make sure that the interfaces of these are very tight, so you use uh, qualifiers like in, out correctly, um, you make sure there aren't any extra parameters, and you make sure that uh, data is local whenever possible, um, uh, that can uh, result in a uh, lot better timing. So in my case, I first wrote the code in some sort of a lazy way that worked, and uh, I was just passing one big uh, in-out variable through everything. Uh, and when I changed that to only pass the information I really needed, and uh, I, uh, I restructured things to use in and out uh, as tightly as possible, I was able to get a 20% better timing result compared to, uh, to the, pre the original code with no functionality change, only by making the code structure better. So um, that's, uh, so uh, what the, the idea here to keep in mind is that we always want to think about uh, this processing as signal moving through the circuit. And so from that, it follows that parallelism is almost free. Um, data locality is very important because uh, that way you don't accumulate delays and being late is really bad, so you want to avoid that. So, um, one, and, uh, after I solved these problems, I was actually able to finally build my design. And here you can see uh, running a traffic generator uh, 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 test uh, with the hardware. And as you can see, we are getting uh, 40 gigabits per second. Um, as uh, we had set out to do. So yay, it works. And um, if we uh, if we look at the, uh, I don't know, I posted, um, I don't know if it's visible well on the video, but um, eventually when, the, when we stop the test, which takes a while, uh, we, we would also see that there has been no packet loss. So we are truly running at 40 gigabits per second with zero packet loss. Um, so, yay, success. Um, yeah, now, now it should be visible. Yeah, um, at the very bottom of the, of the left pane, we can see a number of input packets and output, output, output packets. So, it packets. so it works, great. Um, and what have we learned from this? Um, so in terms of network protocol design, we have learned that variable and fields are really bad. Uh, that was uh, the cause of most of these problems. That was why I was running into timing issues because writing the, that parser was a um, um, lot of well, uh, really complicated. Um, and another uh, uh, other issues that I haven't gone into in the presentations uh, uh, where um, it should be parsable without interpretation. So, for example, a tag that implicitly defines uh, the next field's length is really bad because then you have to think about, okay, how, what does this mean? Um, also, having lengths explicitly rather than continue flags um, is a bad idea. So, um, those are some uh, inputs that we passed on to the designers of the science protocol. And if you avoid these, uh, you, will uh, you will end up with a protocol uh, that uh, when implemented is easier to pipeline and parallelize and thus it can be implemented uh, in faster and cheaper hardware. Um, so uh, in terms of high-speed pro pa packet processing with P4, I uh, am quite uh, satisfied with P4, <laughs> I would recommend it. Um, it is uh, suitable for even complex protocols. We were able to express uh, the complexity of Sion in P4. And it is a useful abstraction because it is sufficiently high level to actually save time, yet it can run very fast in hardware. We were able to achieve line rate. Um, 
and, uh, uh, and the pipelining and parallelism is handled by the compiler. So that's useful because I don't have to think about, okay, how do I size buffers? How exactly do I want to deal with this? Um, uh, ideally, this saves a lot of work. Um, however, unfortunately, P4 is not really target independent at this point because different targets have different strengths and limitations. For example, uh, with the um, parser problem I talked about, a loop would be a perfectly good solution in software, but it's not a good solution in hardware. And so depending on what you're targeting, you will need to write different code, um, especially if you're trying to get uh, performance. Uh, you will need to write target specific code. And um, another problem was that the conversion of P4 code into target specific uh, implementation is not really obvious. It was sometimes pretty difficult to figure out um, which P4 code resulted in this problematic issue in the final design, especially as someone who is not a hardware person, this took a lot of guesswork. So uh, better tooling here would really help in this respect. But still overall, I think P4 is a good solution for implementing uh, packet processors. And in terms of writing a friendly P4 code, some general guidelines are, you should always keep in mind the key idea that uh, what you're creating in the end is a circuit uh, where the data moves through it. Um, and so you should make good use of pipelining. This is largely automated with P4, but writing code that pipelines well is still important. For example, with the loops don't pipeline well idea. Um, and uh, uh, a problem you will run into if your code is sufficiently complex is how to meet timing. Uh, and in this, uh, for this, it is better to write wider code or, or uh, something that can run in parallel rather than uh, deep code, which has uh, long dependency chains in the data. But also it might sometimes be useful to think about the trade-offs because maybe you can come up with some middle way that is better than either of the extremes. Um, and you should also make sure to write small self-contained modules and uh, make the interfaces very tight. So correctly use in and out keywords. Um, this is a good idea because it results in code with better timing, but also because it results in better code that you will not hate yourself for a couple of years later. <laughs> um, and if I had a time machine, I would still use P4. I think it's a good abstraction. And I would um, start prototyping early and more often because uh, um, uh, I would like to be able to discover problems and workarounds earlier and I would get paid for it because this turned out to be a lot of work. <laughs> um, thank you for your attention and I'm hoping uh, you have some questions. Awesome, yeah, fantastic. Yeah, uh, congratulations, by the way. This seems like uh, you're able to get it working and sometimes it can take a lot of perseverance to get, to get a, a design working in hardware and running at line rate. Um, yes. But it sounds like you you were able to do it, so good job. Um, Thank you. Uh, it's not the, yeah. The, so it sounds like the main limitations you are running into, at least with regards to the parser. Um, I, I just like to tease out the limitations of P4 versus the limitations of like the the what's now the legacy SDNet compiler, um, because it it seems like if if the compiler had supported header stacks or variable length uh, parsing, then you wouldn't have run into the same issues that you were running into with the parser, right? Um, I suppose this is true. I don't know how uh, the, uh, like I understand that the SDNet compiler was a proof of concept, so it's okay if it doesn't support everything. Um, I wonder how the uh, how an FPGA like any FPGA implementation would deal with variable lengths in general but yes if the compiler supports it and if it actually results in code that pipelines well and doesn't have timing problems yes that would solve the problem yeah that's correct okay yeah uh I mean because so everything you describe in in the p4 language itself uh the way that the language is designed is that it's supposed to be able to be efficiently implemented in hardware and run at line rate like that's those are the the reasons why the the key language features are are chosen. Um, yes. So theoretically, if you if you have a good compiler, uh, then you should be able to run those like parsing variable length header fields and 
and header stacks are not fundamentally challenging things to do to implement in hardware. It's just the uh, limitation of the current SDNet compiler, which, by the way, a lot of those limitations have been or are are in the process of being fixed right now with the 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 newer SDNet compiler. So hopefully, hopefully, uh, the if you were to use the new compiler, you wouldn't run into the same issues. Hopefully, um, yeah. Uh, but by the way, did, what was the hardest part? Was was the hardest part implementing the parsers or implementing your custom extern or something else? Uh, so I did not have to uh, implement the custom extern myself. I got an AES implementation from somewhere else, from uh, okay. our colleagues in University of 11. So all I needed to do is figure out how to um, put it together with the with the interface. Um, okay. So I wrote some glue very log there, but um, not too much. Um, okay. The parser was quite hard because of just always running into a new problem when I solved the old one. <laughs> um, so it was kind of frustrating. Um, but I think the hardest part in the, in the end was meeting timing, because especially I, uh, as a software engineer, like when I was starting this project, I had no idea what timing meant. <laughs> and yeah. then suddenly this thing comes out and it tells me timing constraint violated and I'm like what's a timing constraint <laughs> yeah so yeah, that was quite a learning curve and there I was running into the issue of it not being obvious which p4 code is actually causing the problem because um, in the end what comes out of uh, of the Vivado implementation is um, it's not obvious how that corresponds to the original p4 source code and so mm -hmm figuring out which parts of the P4 code to change so that something changes in that is was was a lot of guesswork and learning by <laughs> trial and error. Yeah. So yeah. 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 Fun. If you're if you're writing custom like your own Verilog and then you can run the Vivado tools, you can generate the timing reports and you can usually figure out where the timing uh, paths are. Except the problem with using SDNet is like a lot of the like the the internal circuit is obfuscated, so you can't yes, really. It's hard to see it. where the timing can, where the uh, where the timing constraints are happening. So I definitely yeah, I exactly. agree that that mm -hmm. uh, more support from Xilinx and on the SDNet compiler team from the SDNet compiler team to maybe analyze those reports and tell you where the timing constraints are happening. Yeah, that, um, would great, yeah. that would that would that would be very very useful. Uh, and did you do any uh, prototyping? on targets other than P net FPGA? Did you use BMV2 or Tofino? Yeah, so I started with BMV2 and I was trying to keep my code portable uh, all along. Um, um, for quite a long time it was, and then I essentially gave up because it was too much work. Um, as I mentioned, I was running into all of these limitations and places where I needed to write different code for the FPGA uh, versus the software uh, switch. And thus, at some point, I kind of gave up on it. But for a while, it was portable between the two. <laughs> okay. Um, and yeah, I think it was a useful exercise to see which parts can stay portable and which parts need to be um, uh, where I need to write different code depending on the target. I see. Yeah. And mm -hmm. were you able to write the the parser using header stacks and variable length um, yes. parsing in BMB two? Yes, that worked. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Excellent. Um, nice. And uh, I, so I definitely agree. It sounds like the, the hardest parts or one of, one of the challenges that you mentioned with the implementation was getting the timing constraints. There's another, there's another challenge that comes up, which didn't sound like you, you ran into with this project is uh, like stateful processing. Did you have any externs that required stateful processing like registers or anything um, like that? I used uh, some registers for configuration and like configuration data and some for exporting statistics um, but okay. they weren't a core feature of the project so I see yeah yeah, yeah that's uh, that's that tends to be another challenge that people run into when they try to write p4 programs for hardware is trying to figure out what the right read modify write operations are and trying to get those to fit in the timing constraints is often a challenge and reducing mm -hmm. the amount of memory bandwidth that's required. Like right. it's not practical to have multi-ported memory in high-speed hardware. Um, mm -hmm. So that, that ends up being a challenge. Um, yeah. 
yeah, so a, a fantastic talk. It sounds like you were very successful, so congratulations. And uh, I'm sure this talk will be useful for other software engineers that want to write their P4 programs for hardware targets. Thank you. Thank you.